Good morning. Um, welcome to another session of Engineering 260, this time with audio. Glad you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> uh, to review the, um, the announcements I was just going over, um, we are going to go back into capacitance and inductance today. We were scheduled to start first order RC and RL circuits today um, on the 22nd today. Um, but I, you know, I'm cognizant of the fact that we've been moving through material at a pretty um, steady pace. And I feel like we should just spend a little more time just looking at inductance and capacitance uh, this week, go through a couple more problems, and we can start first order response, um, first order circuits next week. That starts to get into differential equations, um, just as a heads up. So if you have not taken differential equations before, um, just know that, uh, you know, we're going to, I'm going to, I'll derive the response for those problems um, and for those scenarios from basic principles. So essentially from calculus principles. And, um, and you know, uh, so not to fret if you haven't taken differentials yet. Um, if you have, hopefully, you know, it'll be seeing this uh, in, a, in, you know, from a new approach approach and different treatment might um, help provide more context to the differential equations course you've taken or are taking simultaneously. Um, so that'll adjust our schedule a little bit. I'm going to move, you know, our first order, uh, we have a week of, of first order our um, circuits and that'll get bumped down here. So I'm going to need to adjust our, our tentative schedule a little bit. Probably some of the topics down at the, at the end will, will be con consolidated or, or, um, or um, probably consolidated and just covered a little bit more briefly. Um, <clears throat> so that's one announcement. Another announcement is that if you go over to our Canvas page, um, a reminder that uh, today we're having a practice session um, <clears throat> on uh, uh, just a place for us to practice some problems outside of class. and. Um, we're going to focus on mostly feminine circuits. Uh, I will record portions of it. I, I want it to be an open space where students can work with, you know, without the red light on. But if there are times where um, I'm kind of going through a strategy or an approach to solving a problem, uh, I will uh, I will try to remember to turn the record back on and um, post that for you guys who cannot make it. Um, those of you who can join, uh, looking forward to see you there this afternoon at one. Last announcement is that the, if you go to the modules page, um, the supplemental homework for op amps is posted, uh, homework 7.5. Uh, I gave a lot of time to work on that. I set it due at November 10th. Is that, is that right? I thought this was, um, well, I'll have to look at that, but I thought it was going to be due November 5th. But anyways, at the, there's plenty of time to work on it. Um, <clears throat> uh, some of the problems, as, as you'll see, the, the first few are, are designed to be kind of warm up problems. Um, they might look like, you know, you know, not sure how to start it at first, but they are they are intended to be pretty quick problems. Um, <clears throat> and they might not look like it at first, but you may recognize that they're common op amp blocks and that really simplifies the analysis. Um, some of the other problems actually go into cascaded circuits, um, which you've seen, there's a video on, uh, posted on Canvas. I directed your attention to it. In fact, um, here it is. If you click on this link, it'll bring you to an example where you can go to this tab on cascaded op amp circuits, and you can follow through some example problems there. Uh, so please do check that out as you're, as you're watching, um, as you're preparing to do that video or that homework assignment. Um, I will post another video on um, cascaded op amps and also um, on uh, multi-stage op amp circuits that have, in other words, there's more than, uh, there's two or more op amps um, that have multiple feedback paths. Um, <clears throat> you'll see what I'm talking about when we get to that point, but I wanted to post a video for you on that so that, um, th there are some problems that actually have that in, in the homework and I, uh, it, it looks more challenging than it is at first. And I'll show you in the, in the video, I'll show you ways to approach it from basic principles using nodal analysis. And I'll also show you, um, a strategy for how to approach it using, um, some 
more uh, kind of clever or, or um, efficient techniques um, using uh, uh, using um, uh, techniques like superposition and source transformation and things like that. Okay. Um, so I think that's most of my announcements. So let's jump back into our, um, our lesson on capacitance and inductance. So last we left off, we talked about that you can create, you can take a coil of wire or you can take a wire. Any wire has, you know, if you run current through it, it will um, generate a magnetic field around it. And if you then wrap that, um, that uh, wire in a, in a, in a um, coil, into a coil, you get a very uniform magnetic field through the center of that coil, as we talked about last lesson. Um, <clears throat> When you're running current through a coil like that, energy is actually stored in um, the magnetic field through the center of that thing. Um, you know, how much energy? Well, it, it actually changes um, depending on if there's just air inside of the coil or you fill it with some kind of medium. So you take some kind of physical material and you put that through the center of the coil. Um, typically, uh, Electronic, des the designers, if you're creating an inductor, you'll choose a material that is ferromagnetic um, or susceptible to um, magnetic stimulus. And, uh, you know, iron is a common, um, common material used because it's highly magnetic. Um, <clears throat> so if you run current through uh, a, the inductor coil, a voltage will develop across that inductor that is um, proportionate to the derivative of the current through it. In fact, it's equal to the inductance L of the inductor times the derivative of the current di dt. That's the voltage that develops across it. Um, <clears throat> the inductance itself is a property of um, the, it's a, a geometric property of, of the uh, inductor. So how many turns, uh, N is the number of turns in the coil. In this simple example that we had right here, as I said yesterday, uh, Tuesday, we had three turns, um, <clears throat> but you can make them with tens, the hundreds, thousands of turns. Um, and uh, the cross-sectional area A of the coil and the length of the coil L, um, <clears throat> the permittivity of the material, the, mag the magnetic permittivity of the material inside also determines how much inductance there is. Okay, and that's the symbol for an inductor. And we actually went through and talked about <clears throat> um, some important characteristics that, um, you know, for a DC signal, um, the current is constant through an inductor and therefore DIDT is zero. Um, <clears throat> and so if DIDT is zero, that means the, the voltage across the inductor is zero. So an inductor under DC conditions behaves like a short circuit. And we're gonna explore that fact a little bit more today. Um, <clears throat> we also know that the power in an inductor, as we saw last time, is L times I times the derivative of the current, di dt, and the energy stored in an inductor is one half the inductance times the square of the current flowing through it. Continuity of energy dictates that the inductor current cannot jump, and we are going to see that play out um, very strongly as we go into um, RC and RL circuits next week. Okay. Um, <clears throat> last, we talked about parasitics. Um, on ideal versus practical inductors. And um, the fact that any inductor has some resistance winding, some winding resistance, and some, uh, some winding capacitance. Okay, um, now last we left off, we actually um, solved this circuit and found for under DC conditions, we found the inductor current and the capacitor voltage. Um, and the main takeaway here is that, you know, if, if you, if you um, if you analyze under DC conditions, the inductor behaves like a short circuit, and the capacitor behaves like an open circuit, and that really simplified the circuit there. With um, you know, once the capacitor is fully charged up, it acts like an open circuit, and therefore no current flows through that four ohm uh, resistor, and um, and thereby no voltage across it. So this node is VC and the current through um, the inductor, the inductor is a short. 
Uh, so it allowed us to do some pretty simple voltage divider calculations and uh, current calculations to find uh, the voltages and currents. And once we knew those voltages and currents, we could easily go and find um, the, uh, the energy stored in the capacitor and uh, the energy stored in the inductor. Okay, um, so, so let's then go ahead and do another one of these problems. So here's another circuit um, <clears throat> with a five milliamp source um, and there's a couple of resistors and in a uh, two millihenry inductor and a six microfarad capacitor um, in this network. Okay, and so we've been asked to find under DC conditions, under DC conditions. So remember again, when you see DC conditions, that means that uh, the capacitor behaves like an open circuit. And the inductor behaves like a short circuit. Okay, so let's then redraw the circuit under those circumstances. And we'll see that what looks maybe like a complicated circuit actually ends up being pretty straightforward. So we've got our five milliamp source here, a 30K resistor, the inductor has been shorted, the capacitor is open, and there's one more 20K resistor on the outside there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So what are the things we're looking for? We want to find, um, let's just put this in purple here. We want to find the voltage across the, capa the capacitor, VC. And we want to find um, the current through the inductor, IL. So let's draw the uh, resistive values on there. We have, this is 30 kilo ohms. And here is a 20 kilo ohm resistor. And so what what you know now that we've we've analyzed under DC conditions, this circuit ends up being pretty straightforward. It's a five milliamp source driving a parallel combination of a 30k, 20k resistor. Um, so we could actually pretty quickly calculate VC. Um, VC is just gonna be it's five milliamps times um, the parallel combination, the 20K parallel 30K. And what is that 20K? Uh, let's just hop over to MATLAB for a second here. So 20 times 30 over 20 plus 30 is 12 kilo ohms. So this is five milliamps times 12 kilo ohms, which I believe is 60 volts, right? Five milliamps, five times 12 is, is uh, 60 and a milliamp times a kilo ohm is, is a volt. All right, so we got, we got that one. And um, now we wanted to do IL. Um, this ends up being a nice simple current divider because we noticed that now that the <clears throat> here's a, here's a, a, an important conceptual leap that you need to make um, is that you know the current going through the inductor well under any conditions it might split and you know go between the capacitor and then over here through the 20k resistor right like the current through the inductor would but um, <clears throat> There, uh, these aren't any conditions. These are the DC conditions. And under DC conditions, the capacitor is fully charged and acts like an open circuit here. And so any current flowing through the inductor has to actually continue to make its way and um, go through the 20 kilo ohm uh, resistor. Um, so then uh, this is a simple current divider equation. This is a five milliamp source times the path you're not interested in, 30K over the uh, 30 plus, uh, dang it, okay, uh, whoops, over the 30, let's see, over the 30 plus 20 uh, 
source there. So that's, uh, what is that? Five milliamps times three fifths. Um, and so it looks like that is IL is equal to three milliamps. Okay, and and there we go. So that's a, that's a that's what it is. We could have done it another way. Actually, now that we know VC, that's the voltage across the 20k. I suppose we could have done um, something like uh, we could have said, well, okay, IL equals I through the 20k um, is equal to VC because that's the voltage on the capacitor is par in parallel with the 20k divided by 20k. Uh, or 60 volts over 20 kilo ohms is three milliamps. And so either way that you get there is fine. Um, but, uh, you know, the, again, the conceptual leap is kind of the fact that under DC conditions, all of the inductor current flows through that 20 kilo ohm resistor. Okay. Um, so, So here we go. Let's um, let's go ahead and uh, analyze another kind of. Uh, oh, uh, first let's talk about series and parallel inductors. Okay, without deriving the the relationships like we did with um, capacitance, I'm just going to cut to the chase that in series um, inductors inductors that are in series add together. Um, in fact, they behave just like resistors. Um, inductors that are in parallel, the equivalent inductance is um, the reciprocal of that is equal to the sum of the reciprocals. So in parallel, they they you know add together just like resistors do. Um, the same way that we did for resistors, um, where you can find the um, parallel combination. You know, I use this formula all the time, right? We just used it on the last problem. Um, the product of the two resistors divided by the sum of the two resistors. Since inductors add just like resistors do, you can actually use that shortcut as well for inductances. Um, since inductors behave like resistors, you can actually use voltage and current divider equations um, the same way that you would with uh, resistors. So if you had a circuit, as we've shown down here, um, a voltage source driving two inductors, L1 is going to have some voltage across it. Let's call it V1. L2 is going to have some voltage across it. Let's call it V2. And if you wanted to find V2, you can actually um, calculate it. Uh, and this is for non-steady state. Because under steady state, the, the, inductor, the inductors are just short, right? They're just short circuits. So in fact, this, is, this would be a bad circuit for steady state because that voltage source is going to have the, the inductor would short, L1 would short, L2 would short. And it would just short the voltage source, which is going to be hazardous to the electronics in that in that voltage source. Um, but under non-steady state conditions, uh, I mean, it, I guess it applies any time. But it, it's uh, <laughs> you know the voltage across an inductor is zero under steady state. It's a short, so it, it it's really more so for non use use these um, in non uh, steady state conditions. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, so you can actually calculate the voltage V2 across as, as a, you know, uh, L2 over L1 plus L2 times the voltage source Vs driving both of those. So let's actually then utilize the fact that voltage and current divider equations apply. And let's solve a circuit um, here. Here's a circuit with all inductors um, that is not steady state. Notice that um, there, the current coming into this um, into the uh, circuit here has been defined as um, I is I times one minus e to the negative ten t. This is non-steady state. Okay, um, and so, so what we want to find then is all of the um, voltages and currents. We're gonna we want to find V of t. 
So let me actually write that on here. This is this just is, says v, but I want to find v of t. Let's also um, annotate the fact that this current i here is i of t, right? Which has been given up there at the top. Um, we're going to label some of these inductors. Um, so this is L1. Uh, this is L2. And this inductor here is L3. OK. Um, and we want to find the voltages. Um, we want to find V of T, the voltage developed across the whole port. That's this one here. We want to find V1 of T, the voltage across this inductor here. V2 of T, the voltage across the 4 Henry and 12 Henry pair. I1 of T, so the current flowing down through L2, through the, through the 4 Henry inductor. And I2 of T, the current flowing down through the 12 Henry inductor. OK. Um, <clears throat> Now, one of the ways that we could start is maybe just by finding the voltage um, V of T. Let's, let's start by looking for the voltage V of T, which I'll colorize in purple here. V of T, the voltage um, across the whole port, V of T, well, it should be equal to L equivalent, whatever the equivalent inductance is seen across the port, times DI L um, L equivalent. Well, it's in this case, it's just di dt because the current d, uh, i of t is what's flowing into the equivalent inductance. So let's draw what that looks like, the equivalent circuit over here, right? So here's, here's um, an equivalent inductor. So here's LEQ. And we want to find the voltage developed across that port, V of t. And we know that the current entering that whole port is the current that's already been given. That's 8 times 1 minus e to the negative 10t um, in milliamps. <clears throat> OK, so, um, so then what we need to do is find L equivalent, right? So let's find L equivalent. L equivalent, um, remember, inductors add just like resistors do. So this is going to be 2 Henry's. Um, two Henry's plus the parallel combination, the four Henry L2, or here we can actually write it in terms of the inductances, right? This is L1 plus L2 parallel L3. That's the, uh, that's the, res uh, the equivalent inductance here. So this is the two Henry plus a four parallel 12. 4 parallel 12 is 3 Henry's. And so LEQ is equal to 5 Henry's. All right. OK, so now that we have that, we can actually go and plug that in for um, L equivalent up here. So V of T, sticking with our purple color scheme here, uh, V of T is equal to L equivalent. We already found that that's five Henry's times DIDT. All right, so um, DIDT, all right? So if you have, um, we're taking the derivative, I'll, I'm gonna erase this in a second, but the derivative of eight um, minus eight e to the minus 10 T. Okay, so what I've done is just factored in the eight into both of those um, terms, right? And so, um, you know, you put your calculus hat on for this part, the derivative of this thing, uh, the constant is zero, and the derivative of negative 8e to the minus 10t is, well, it's negative 8e uh, e to the minus 10t times negative 10, right, times the derivative of the inside, okay? Um, so, in other words, that's going to get you a positive 80e to the negative 10t. All right, so uh, we'll put that in here. This is uh, this is times 80 e to the negative 10 t. Okay, and now we can erase the, our sort of scratch work. Just we hopped over to calc one for a second to calculate that stuff. Okay, um, <clears throat> and so uh, if we multiply that five milli henrys through, or five henrys through, sorry, um, we get that this is. Um, this would be, by the way, the units of this would be 
I think it's uh, milliamps per second, right? That's the derivative of, of milliamps. And so it turns out that when you multiply a Henry times a milliamp per second, you're going to get uh, millivolts. So this is at five times 80 is 400 e to the minus 10 millivolts. All right, so we just got um, the, the first one. There it is. We've got, we've got V of T. Um, now that we have V of T, uh, <clears throat> we could actually, we could actually go and find, um, we actually, I don't think we even needed that to find V1 of T actually. Let's go ahead and look in there. So um, V1 of T, Uh, is equal to L1 times di dt. And we actually already have, we know the current flowing through L1 that's been given, it's I of t. Um, and we know the value for L1. So that's just equal to two Henry's times, we already know the value for um, for di dt, we already found that it's 80 e to the minus 10 t. Um, <clears throat> and so that actually gets us two times that is going to be, remember the units of that 80 times e to the minus 10 t is milliamps per second. And so that's going to be 160 uh, e to the minus 10 t millivolts. All right, so now we got we have V1 of T. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, if we wanted to get V2 of T, we can do that. There's a couple of different ways we could get there. Let's get V2 of T equals, equals what here, right? So a couple of ways we could do it. One is by KVL, or we could do voltage divider equation. Okay. Um, voltage divider is kind of kind of nice. So you know that we have. Um, let's do it by by KVL, I guess. Um, yeah, sure. Let's. Well, uh, <clears throat> all right. We can do it by KVL here. So if we know that this is this is V of T here, right? And then if we lose, um, so if we take V of T and we subtract off V1 of T, we know that that actually gets us V2 of T. So that's one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, that would get us, this would be, um, what is it? It's 400 minus 160, right? V of T was 400 a coefficient of 400, V1 of T was 160, and both of them have the E to the minus 10 T term here. Um, and that's gonna be in millivolts. And so we get that that's, what is that? That's 240 millivolts, or 240 times E to the minus 10 T millivolts. Um, <clears throat> That's one way we could do it. Another way would be to say, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this in a second, but let's say that we have V of T here. We're feeding that through this inductor, and then we have a parallel inductor here. So this is the four parallel, or what we could, what we could say is L2 parallel L3, and this is L1. And if you wanted the voltage across those, V2, you could say V2 of T is V of T times, um, well, the, the one you're interested in, remember four parallel 12, that is three Henry's over two plus three Henry's. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, and so that is, um, if you were to do that, V of T is what? It's 400 uh, times E to the minus 10 T uh, 
times three fifths. And what is that? That's um, 400 divided by five is 80, right? 400 over five is 80 and 80 times three is 240. So what we're seeing is that there's different ways that you can, you can get to this. Um, we're using, we're seeing that you can use KVL with these things. Um, you know, all, everything still holds. We have, we're now looking at currents and voltages that are functions of time. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's, there's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not DC like we've been seeing earlier in the semester. Um, but what we're seeing is that, you know, Kirchhoff's law still holds for any instant in time, the voltages summed around a loop are equal to one another. Um, for any instant in time, the currents in and out of a node are equal to one another. And so these are good things to keep track of. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, and then you can still use voltage divider equation as long as things are truly in series. You can use current divider as long as they're in parallel and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm gonna erase the voltage divider approach that we took here. And we're going to go this way. This is taking a really long time to erase for some reason. Okay, I think PowerPoint is just a little hung up. Okay, um, now we want to find, let's say we want to find I2 of T or I1 of T. Um, we can find this with current divider, right? Because I of T is coming into this node and then it's going to split um, and go down through I1 of T and I2 of T, right? These currents, it's gonna split between those. So we can find that I1 of T is just, um, well, it's gonna be I of T times the path you're not interested in. The, um, that's, this is I1 flowing down through here. The other path is this 12 Henry path. So 12 over four plus 12 um, which gives us uh, three fourths I of T, um, which would be then, let's go ahead and put that in. This would be three fourths of um, eight uh, minus eight E to the minus 10 T. Um, which would then give us that I1 of T is equal to um, three fourths of eight is six. So this would be six times one uh, minus, I didn't leave myself enough room here, hang on. I1 of T is six times one minus e to the minus 10 T in milliamps. And you could do the same for, you know, current divider for, um, for I2. But once we know I, I1 and we know I, I, the current coming in here, then by the junction rule, by KCL, if you have eight milliamps, you know, at this exponential decay coming in and six of them flow down through the four Henry inductor, then the other two of them have to flow down through the 12 Henry inductor, right? So I2 of T just by inspection is two times one minus E to the minus 10 T and that's in milliamps. Okay. Um, any questions or clarifications I can address on this? Uh, particular problem.
Okay, um, well, let's just talk about a couple of things and then we'll wrap up um, this, this lesson. So um, passive elements are resistors, capacitors, and inductors. They're passive because they don't require um, any external source of power, like we've seen that diodes and transistors do, especially transistors, right? Or even op amps, those are active components that you have to power them up with some DC source for them to be able to do their job. Um, <clears throat> resistors, capacitors, and inductors um, uh, can uh, store energy. Uh, well, actually resistors can't, but capacitors and inductors can. And that's a useful feature. <laughs> it turns out to have a lot of um, wide ranging applications. Um, so recall that the energy, you know, power in any component is equal to V times I in any component. And um, the energy stored in any component is the integral of the power with respect to time. Okay, um, so uh, if you look at, um, let's see, the energy in, in an inductor is one half Li squared. The energy in a capacitor is one half Cv squared. The energy uh, dissipated through an inductor is the sum of all the, of the I squared R losses in the uh, res resistor, sorry, the energy in a resistor is the sum of this, this integral sign, the sum of the I squared R losses over time. Um, uh, just one thing to note is that, you know, resistors uh, uh, don't store power, uh, don't store energy. They only dissipate energy. So, um, so uh, oops, that's supposed to say does not does not store energy. Um, they only dissipate energy, right? They get hot and then they radiate that energy out to the outside world. In other words, the energy within the circuit is lost to some other system. Um, sometimes that's intentional, like um, in a toaster oven, you want to heat up a segment of wire and uh, you know it's, it's, re it's got resistance, so you run current through it, it gets hot and then it toasts your bread. Um, but capacitors and inductors both store energy. Um, and if we compare that with mechanics, um, we'll recall that you know, a, a mass can store energy in its motion. Uh, masses in motion have energy. They have kinetic energy, right? Um, so if you let u equal um, velocity, OK, um, then we know that uh, a, a force exerted on a mass causes it to accelerate. Um, at uh, du dt, uh, where u is the velocity. Um, a spring has, um, has a, uh, stores energy in it um, based on the, uh, the spring constant, k, or the stiffness of the spring, times the uh, displacement, x. Um, of the spring from its relaxed length. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then also recall that friction, um, fluid friction or friction between surfaces um, provides uh, a force on an object that is equal to, well, in fact, in fluid friction, sorry, uh, not, not friction between surfaces, um, it provides a force against objects through that fluid um, that is equal to the uh, drag coefficient uh, <clears throat> times the uh, velocity, okay? Um, so it turns out there's a mechanical analogy um, for ele electrical systems, or in other words, electrical systems are um, an analogy of mechanical systems. Um, and so for, uh, you know, mechanical force, that's analogous to uh, voltage for um, mechanical uh, speed or velocity that's analogous to current capacitance in an, an electrical circuit is analogous to stiffness or a spring in a mechanical system a uh, a res resistance in an electrical circuit is an ana is analogous to drag uh, the drag coefficient in fluid um, systems uh, the equations are the same right like this is you know, Ohm's law, would, this would be V equals R times I, uh, the spring 
stiffness here if you integrate the um the four of it's harder to show but if you integrate the the energy for a capacitance you'll find the power for it you'll, you'll find that it's c times uh let's see uh the charge um how much charge is, is going through it so at any rate there's a, an analogy between electrical and mechanical systems and um this fact is is highly useful um, because, well, and especially before there were computers that could solve differential equations numerically, um, one of the things that people used to do, engineers used to do, um, to solve complex mechanical systems where the system dynamics was not easily solved on paper, they would actually assemble a circuit, an electronic circuit that represented the mechanics of the system. And the voltages in the circuit were analogous to forces that um, the mechanical system would experience. Um, currents in the system were analogous to velocities that um, objects within the mechanical system would be traveling at. And you know, capacitance would be representing springiness or stiffness, like the shocks in a in a in a in a car, shock absorbers in a car or a bike frame or something like that. And you're and they're able to solve for um, you know very, fairly complicated uh, mechanical systems the system dynamics in other words the differential equations to find solutions to those systems. So um, with that, I just wanted to point out that um, those of you you know we're going to be going into um, first order and second order differential equations or first order and second order circuits in the coming weeks. And the, the work that we're going to do here, the equations we're going to arrive at are exactly the same as uh, me mechanical analogs uh, and analogies, mechanical an analogies that, that, are, that are, are the mechanical counterpart to those circuits. So we'll look at a, an RLC circuit, resistance, inductance, and capacitance. And um, it turns out that that models a, a, a mechanical system with mass, um, uh, you know, inductance is, is representative of mass, uh, a spring like capacitance and, um, and uh, viscous friction um, like resistance. And it turns out that the solutions to the electrical system and the solutions to the mechanical system, numerically, at least in terms of what the formulas look like and the equations, they're the same. They're the exact same. So if you can solve an, uh, a second order circuit in um, or second order differential equation in circuits, you can also solve a second order differential equation in mechanics. Um, and, you know, you guys are going to be transferring on to, to your, um, you know, universities soon, and, and you'll, you'll likely take some kind of class in, um, you know, for mechanical and electrical and computer engineers, they often take a class that's called something like linear systems. And it goes into, um, you know, looking at the, the second order response of mechanical and electrical systems. Uh, for civil engineering majors, you, you'll likely take a class called, I don't know, structural vibrations or something like that. Um, and and in, that, in that class, you're essentially looking at the same kind of response. You're looking at systems of a, a mass, a, a building or a structure shaking back and forth by, by the ground motion. And, um, and in fact, they, you, you know, it's the, the equations are analogous. They're the same as what we're going to derive over the next few weeks. Um, they're just in, in context to a structural application and looking at the mechanics of that instead of an electronic application and looking at, at the electronic dynamics of it. Um, so I just wanted to give you that, um, that kind of heads up. And as we go into the next couple weeks here, the material um, you know, uh, is, is something that uh, you, know, you, wanna, you wanna really focus on this port, part of the um, or portion of the uh, course in terms of preparing you to go on into those next courses. So I guess all to say that um, this portion of the uh, of the uh, course is is really good practice and preparation for your later courses in linear systems and structural vibrations. Uh, so I hope that uh, you know you 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 enjoy and get a good a good, um, you know, solid foundation out of what we'll cover in the coming weeks. Um, it's pretty cool content and we'll talk about some applications of it as we as we go through. All right. Um, well, that wraps up um, my session for what I wanted to cover today. Um, so we'll end a little bit early.
and um, I will see some of you in our problem session later this afternoon. All right, till then. And if I don't see you then, see you Tuesday. Have a good weekend.